Do you get stuck between two answer choices and end up choosing the wrong one? Are you losing confidence or feeling like all of your hard work that you're putting in isn't being translated into higher scores? If so, you've come to the right place. Step one, step two, step three, and shelf exams can feel like a really confusing journey. But imagine that you had a magic GPS or roadmap that would help you navigate to get to the right answers more consistently without having to study more and only having the knowledge that you already have. The NBME, or the National Board of Medical Examiners, has a document that is more than 100 pages that they have created for the people who write questions for step one, two, three, and shelf exams. I have navigated this document multiple times in order to distill the most critical elements so that you can use them to improve your score regardless of where you are in your step journeys. Together, we can chart a course for using the NBME's guidelines for how you can score better in less time. Key point number one, questions test the application of knowledge not the recall of random fact. The NBME makes this abundantly clear throughout the entire document that what they're doing is not testing you on the recall of facts. Note that this is likely different from what you've experienced with your block exams for medical school. Let's think about the exact system that medical professors find themselves in. Their incentives are to try to create the most expedient questions in the least amount of time so they can go and do the work that they were paid to do, which is clinical practice and research. The easiest questions for them to write are going to be things where they can just look at their PowerPoint slides and find random facts that they can test you on to see if you were paying attention. This is very, very different from the NBME. I'm going to read some direct quotes from the NBME question writer's guide, and you can see the difference in the approach for the NBME. One, questions should not focus on the direct assessment of isolated facts. Two, avoid asking about the leading cause of death in some subpopulation. Instead, focus on the application of this knowledge. These are just a small sample of the quotes that you'll find throughout the entire document, emphasizing how the NBME writes questions about conceptual application as opposed to the recall of random knowledge. This is also one of the reasons why oftentimes medical students who do really well on their tests in medical school may struggle with step one, step two, or step three, because the rules for how to do well in these different contexts is gonna be different. Key point number two, the number of questions is proportional to the topic's importance. This one may seem obvious, but more important topics have more questions than less important topics. The NBME says important topics should be weighted more heavily than less important topics. The testing time devoted to each topic should reflect the relative importance of the topic. In other words, you should expect a lot more questions on heart failure, asthma, kidney disease, coronary artery disease, rather than those random questions that you worry about, about congenital diseases. It's true that there are rare diseases, but their rarity on the exam is oftentimes proportional to the rarity that you actually have them in real life. The exception to this would be in something like biochemistry where they're using rare diseases to illustrate a key sort of pathway or a key enzyme and using that as a way to test a key concept. You should spend your time on the things that are more clinically relevant. Either the disease is going to be more serious or it's going to be more common. Important point number three, clinical vignettes weed out memorizers. So we said, the NBME focuses on applying concepts. But how do they do that? The NBME uses clinical vignettes as a way to weed out memorizers and force you to apply important clinical concepts. Here's a direct quote from the NBME on why they like using clinical vignettes. Questions with a clinical vignette as part of the item stem have several benefits. First, the authenticity of the examination is greatly enhanced by using questions that require test takers to solve clinical problems. Second, the questions are more likely to focus on important information rather than trivia. Third, these questions help to identify those test takers who have memorized a substantial body of factual information but are unable to use that information effectively in clinical situations. So do vignettes force you to apply critical knowledge? Check. Do they focus on critical concepts and not esoterica? Check. Do they weed out memorizers? Checkmate. Critical issue number four. There's a single question type. Single best answer, closed responses. So when I was at Stanford, one of the hardest exams that we had was in anatomy. One of the reasons why the exam was so hard is that they would give you a test where there would be like four or five answer choices, and they would say, which of the following answer choices is false? The content itself was difficult, but the format of the test made it extraordinarily more difficult because you had to evaluate five different answer choices and figure out which of them wasn't true. In many ways, this NBME rule 
of having a single best response is actually a boon for people that are taking step one, step two, or step three. And the reason for this is that actually just because the content itself is challenging. They call this question format, single best answer, closed response. Single best answer refers to the fact that there's only one best answer. And closed response refers to the fact that the question is a complete sentence, not a fragment. Critical issue number five, the cover the options rule. If a lead-in is properly focused, a test taker should be able to read the stem and lead-in, cover the options, and guess what the right answer is without seeing the option set. Imagine you've got a room full of experts and they're sitting around a table and they show a question on the screen. That room full of experts should be able to cover the responses, meaning cover the answer choices, and they should all agree at what the answer will be without knowing what the answer choices are. If they can't do that, the question isn't good enough and they're going to throw it out. Let's take a practical example of what this would look like. Let's say, for example, which of the following is true about pseudogout? One, it's clearly hereditary in most cases. Two, it's seldom associated with acute pain in a joint. Three, it may be associated with a finding of chondrocalcinosis. Four, it occurs frequently in women. And five, it responds well to treatment with allopurinol. This is a really good example of a question that would be thrown out on the exam because you can't cover the answer responses and know what it's going to be. The cover the responses rule is a great way for you to test whether the question was poorly written or not, because you should be able to cover the responses and guess what the answer is going to be without knowing the answer choices. Critical issue number six, no one's trying to fool you. Now I know that oftentimes when we get stuck between two answer choices, it feels like the test writers are basically trying to confuse us by putting in information that we don't really understand. For the vast majority of cases, especially for step one, they're really not trying to fool you. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll give you extra details or things like that that might seem confusing, but they're not intentionally going to mislead you. I'm gonna read some quotes from the NBME where they say that their goal is to avoid red herrings or information designed to mislead the test taker. They also are instructing test writers, patients in vignettes should tell the truth. Right, so if you've ever wondered if the patient was just like, you know, lying or something, they're not. The one thing that I will say is that they will add some information, especially on step two or step three, that is kind of designed to confuse you. So an example of this would be, if you've ever seen a patient who had an MI and they also had GERD. The reason why they have GERD is oftentimes to give you an alternative diagnosis or an alternative explanation for why that patient may be coming in with chest pain. They will give you, we call it noise, that might be there to sort of confuse you, but know that the patients themselves are not going to be lying to you or that you should be mistrusting the lab values or anything like that. Critical point number seven is that the vignettes follow the H&P format. This is just something that I think is important to realize. I don't actually think that they talk about this in the question writer's guide, but it is important to recognize how the questions are going to be sequenced. Virtually every single vignette will start with the chief complaint. They won't include every single element every single time of the H&P format, but it will follow the order of the H&P format. If you ever wonder why are they repeating themselves where they just talked about one thing in the first sentence and now they're repeating it in the later sentences, that's really just because that's what would happen in a typical h &P. Critical point number eight is that the NBME has a way of knowing if questions have been shared. They have this concept called validity, which is basically like, is it a good question? Some of the things that they're looking for on this list are the number of students who get a question correct, how well an item discriminates between high scores and low scores, and the critical element, the change in people getting an item correct over time. One of the things that they will know is if a question was showing up on a QBank and then suddenly because the question was so similar on UWorld that everyone was getting it correct, then they might change that question or they might even remove it entirely. This is one way that you can be assured that the test can remain fair and there's not a really easy way to cheat for the exam. So in conclusion, having read this document multiple times and seeing the hundred plus pages and trying to distill the most important points, I can say it's actually in many ways very reassuring. The NBME isn't trying to trick you. They are focused on you trying to be a better doctor by really applying more important concepts. They're focused on the most important sort of clinical concepts, be it the more severe conditions or the things that show up more commonly. If you found this helpful, please be sure to hit the like and subscribe button and let us know in the comments what you think and how well the NBME is doing on their mission of trying to help you to apply the most important clinical concepts.